Ladies and gentlemen, you and I both know there are very few feelings in this world that are better than winning a game of chess. But have you ever been a part of a game or spectated or witnessed a game where you felt like both players deserve to lose? Yes, that is a real feeling. Um, sometimes both sides just catastrophically try to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory or a draw to the extent that you really don't think that they deserve any points at all. Well, once again, the How to Lose a Chess playlist on my YouTube channel strikes, and we have an amazing game today. So let's get into this game. Uh, the players are both rated in the 1100s, which actually means uh, that as much as we will be laughing at the moves, uh, remember, we are not really laughing at the intelligence level of the players. Now we are laughing at, you know, the fact that chess is just a hard game. I mean, like, what are you, you going to do, right? So we have uh, VJ from India. Uh, I think, I don't know if this is him, or, but it looks like a really, you know, like a final boss image photo. Uh, Martin uh, from the United Kingdom had no profile photo, so I just selected Alfred Hitchcock, who is a very, very famous author. Uh, this game, uh, e4 and c6. So because the players are actually quite decent, uh, they are, uh, and don't worry about Stockfish saying Karo Khan is 0. 0.8, doesn't understand the opening. Because these players are actually quite decent, we're, we're going to get like a normal opening. So we're going to have some stuff to learn. So we have an exchange Karo Khan with the move c4. Immediately black is better. How is that possible? Well, the thing is you can't really reinvent the wheel. Like if you're going to play knight f3 against the Karo Khan, um, you, if, when you take, you really should put your second center pawn out. This is just normal. This is just an exchange Karo Khan. Uh, then you can play C4 and then you can, or you can play C3, like normal Karo Khan. C4 is the pan off, of course. The thing is when you do it this way, what black can do here is shove the pawn forward, which is, it's exactly what black does. And now black really has a nice position. Um, if white plays the move, let's say D3, uh, and then develops the bishop this way, black will play knight c6, uh, g3, and e5. So black actually just, I mean, we, we have what's called like a, a Benoni structure, uh, but with colors reversed. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's no reason to give this to black, uh, but black does that. And here, white already plays a very exotic move, which is the move c5. That's just, that's, that's just not really how you play chess. Um, and again, the move c4 was the beginning of white's problems, because they blocked the bishop, and they blocked in their knight, on b1, so you don't really have natural development here. And then you play c5. So c5 is not good because this, this pawn's just gonna die. Like if black does this accurately and plays like, you know, knight c6, e5, like this pawn will just perish. It, it, it really should, it wandered way too far. And the thing is, if you try to build up defenses for it, sure, but by the time you build up defenses for it, black is completely winning with two pawns directly in the middle. So, you know, it's, it's a dangerous lie. So knight c6 is played in bishop c4. And here, black should play, e, uh, computer likes a5, which is an absurd move, but you're trying to prevent anything here. But also, like, you know, moving the e-pawn is, is quite good as well. Black here develops the knight, and, and I mean, white's just going for it. I mean, white, white really just pretended that they knew openings, uh, playing, like, you know, three normal moves, like e4, knight f3, and e5. And after that, white was completely on their own. They, I mean, 1149, but knows openings only up until the second move and still tries to go for like a fried liver attack. Black here has two moves. Of course, you can block the bishop or you can put your knight in the middle, which defends and attacks at the same time. Black plays e6 and white again should be castling or doing something, but instead plays the move f4. So weakening the king even further. If you just go back like four moves, white is like barely worse, like, you know, can be still fighting for advantage, like literally four moves later and it's minus four. This is why you don't need to invent things on your own, okay? When you invent things on your own in the opening as an 1100, it's like, it's like as if, you know, you invited me to like a five-star restaurant and asked me to cook things. Uh, there's a higher chance that I set the kitchen on fire or make someone projectile vomit when I serve them food than actually giving them anything, you know, worthwhile and tasty. Uh, let's trust the chefs, all right? So you got to listen to their instruction and then actually do what's right. F4 is, is absurd, but it has an idea. The idea is F5. So white really wants this. Now black plays a very natural move, right? Bishop, bishop takes pawn. I mean, I told you that pawn was going to die. Black is just winning now. White is still trying to attack. Now, of course, if, if black were to take here, that would still allow white this, but it doesn't even matter anymore because black can very, very easily get out of the danger. But what, is, what, what does black do after F5? Um, black just castles. Black just castles, and after F takes E6... Um, just takes, uh, sorry, it doesn't take on e6, plays queen e7, but even if you do take on e6, and like, let's say, you know, knight e6, okay, worst comes to worst, it's a check, 
There's one bishop developed for white and nothing else. Folks, it's 12 moves for white and nothing has moved. Chess cannot be played like this. Um, and if you take with the bishop with check and it looks like you're going to lose material, who cares if you're going to lose material? I mean, do you, really th you, do you really think that this position is in any way okay for white? Because I'm going to be honest, it's not. It's force made in like 10 moves, 12, 15 moves. Um, so yeah, I mean, f5 is played. Black gets a little scared and, 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 and plays queen e7, like pinning the pawn to the king. Still great board vision here by Martin. Uh, solid board vision for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, f takes e6 uh, and uh, queen e7 uh, and castles. <clears throat> so castles by white. At this point, black should be playing d3 check. In fact, black should have played d3 several times, preventing white from castling, but that doesn't happen. Uh, and, you know, we get d3 check and king h1. So let's just quickly pause here. So black is only up one point of material, but why is it minus eight? Where does the other seven points come from? The other seven points come from an absurd engine move. So there's one move in this position that makes the evaluation minus eight, and it's the move knight e5. Now, to the untrained eye, that simply looks like a giveaway of a piece. Uh, it's not, because you are luring the rook forward to go here. That threatens the rook, and it threatens this, and if you take, there's mate. So knight e5 is intending to attack the bishop and go to g4, and you are not able to be captured. Does that actually mean you're minus eight? No, you're minus eight if and only if you find back-to-back -back knight sacrifices for checkmate. You're more like minus three because white can't develop any pieces and the king is super weak. So black plays knight d4. Knight d4 is a reasonable move, and white here, well, proceeds not with development, but with the loss of material. I mean, white already had it bad enough, but proceeded to just hang a piece. So now bishop e6, knight e6, knight e6, and not only is black just up a lot of material, it's minus 10. It's minus 10 because all of white's pieces are on second and first rank. So horrible position, completely horrible position. Um, terrible opening. Uh, but black gives away a lot of advantage very quickly by just hanging a knight. Just one mover, queen takes knight. The crazy thing is, it's minus 10, but even with the loss of a knight, it's minus 8, which is mind-blowing. It's only minus 8 if you sack your queen, though. If you play knight d4 here, giving up the queen for this mate, you're still winning. Um, you're threatening to take the rook, so let's say the rook goes this way. Now black plays knight c2, there is an attack here, and you just lose. So anytime you look at your opponent's position and you go, wow, all their pieces are stuck, I've got to have a forward attacking move, just don't lose a knight in one move. Black now plays rook e8, so we're just going to move on in this game as if nothing happened. Black just hung a knight, just gave a full knight back to the opponent, but it's still minus seven. So you give away a full knight. Now, psychologically, when you lose a full piece, you're like, uh-oh, and you go on high alert because you're like, I can't lose any more pieces. I really have to focus. White here plays b3. Idea is obviously to play the move bishop b2 and get closer to development. Now, again, the only way that black is winning here is by sacking the queen. Of course, to a human, this doesn't look normal, but knight g5 is a very powerful move. You attack the queen, and the rook has nowhere to go. For example, rook d1, you just sack the queen anyway, and it's just simply made. So, um, yeah, I mean, because white's king is also extremely weak, there are all these attacking possibilities, but black plays the move rook f4. Now, rook f4 absolutely looks like a good move, but it's not. It's a horrible move. Why? Because it can be taken. The same reason that black is not moving the knight because they would lose the queen, they still can't move the knight here. Queen f4, rook f4, takes, takes, and suddenly, white is not even down any material. What? White's not down any material. Oh, sorry, not, not, not even material. White's barely worse. I mean, the, the top engine move here for black is rook e2, hanging the rook to make a queen. I don't think that's going to happen. I, so if, if not rook e2, white's not even worse. So if you can't move the knight, folks, because it's going to, your queen's, gonna, so your, your knight's not guarding your queen here. Now, of course, queen f4 doesn't happen. So it's back to minus 10. Okay. Black attacks the rook. The rook moves. And white here, uh, sorry, black here plays one of the worst moves ever. Just simply ever. When you have such a dominant position, you absolutely cannot trade queens. Your queen is your most powerful attacking weapon. Go rook h4. Okay, this can't be taken. The queen's hanging. Then try to attack on h2. Queen on c7. Something like this. All right? You, you can't sack because the queen blocks. But 
do not trade queens. Why are you trading queens? The only piece that white has playing is the queen, and you're gonna trade off the most powerful attacking piece? Are you for real? Now, folks, you, you already know this is how to lose a chess. We have much more drama ahead, like the fact that white hangs the queen in one move. So not only does the queen arrive for an exchange, white hangs, queen takes h3. Now, here I have to give credit to white because white didn't just take the rook. White did not do this. All right, because that would have led to mate. Instead of that, white was like, oh, I got to move my bishop. So white's playing on. It's mate in three. Black can end the game right now, but you and I both know that's obviously not going to happen. Uh, black can end the game because there's this, and you just take on g3, and then it, it would take a donkey not to find checkmate here. Okay, and I mean, even it could be a donkey who's like 600 and might still find mate. Queen h2 is just mate. Rook f1 is mate. It's unstoppable. Bishop g3. Okay, great. Black plays rook f3. I don't hate that move. Obviously, black was like my rook is hanging. So both players are kind of cerebral. Now here, knight d5. Again, bishop takes g3 or rook g3. Whichever piece just arrived there, you can take with. You might as well bring the knight. Instead of that, black plays this move and hangs the rook. Now, it is still mate. But there was no need to lose a rook for absolutely no reason. What was the point of the move rook f8? I mean, all the action is right here. Right here. Well, you got to just find something, right? You got to trust the fact that with the queen on the board, you have something. Okay, instead of that, we hang the rook for a bishop. It still doesn't matter because black has now a seven-point material advantage instead of a nine-point material advantage. And the evaluation is so high, it has an M in front of it like a BMW. Okay, M9. Now it's bishop takes g3, rook c1, bishop g3, it's mate once again. It's just mate. Nope, we're going to bring the knight. I mean, I don't know why we're bringing the knight. Now we are allowing a check. The one thing you want to not allow, um, especially when your king is wide open like this, is checks. You want to make sure you can hide. And one of the ways you can hide is kind of on the edge of the board. The king on h7 is nicely tucked away. Now it has to kind of walk to the middle, which I don't like. Knight back to f8, check, and king h8. Very luckily, that is covered. So, rook c c1. Okay, fantastic. Bishop takes g3 has been made a million times, but it, it, it's going to continue to be made a million times as black makes a getaway square for the king and brings the knight once again. So, black has made no progress, absolutely no progress in like seven moves after playing rook f3. Nothing is moving. The rook is not moving. The bishop is not moving. Black doesn't know what to do. All right, 96, 93. Okay, terrific. Now, at this point, if you accidentally give away your rook, you're still winning because... The less pieces white has on the board, the better. The queen, the bishop, the knight, the pawn are going to all win the game for you. But that isn't going to happen. Also, you could play rook e3 and sacrifice like this, all right? Instead of that, black plays knight d4. Black just forgot that they could capture anything. They forgot that they could capture anything. They played knight d4. I suppose they're wandering in. So black hasn't captured a piece in like eight turns over here in this area. Rook c4 attacking the knight. And now black finally remembers that they can capture a piece. Bishop takes e3 here. Bishop g3. Black remembers that they can capture a piece. Takes on f1, expecting the game to end. Now, that doesn't look that surprising because for a while you've kept an eye on this rook. The rook has now moved. But the knight takes the queen. Now, tragically, black is still completely winning. So even though white has lost everything and sort of began gain gaining it back black is still up a bishop and what's worse than that is this knight has nowhere to go and what's worse than that is that this pawn will be captured very quickly and allow a queen that is why this position is still completely winning for black knight e2 king g2 rook f6 rook e4 now the way you win this is you bring the bishop out and you bring the rook in and that's it bring the bishop out bring the rook in instead of that black brings the knight out for some reason uh, and after knight e3, I mean, you take, right? Now we suddenly remember that we can capture stuff. D takes e3. So two things can attack this, right? And I'm sure that if you move the knight and then put the rook behind the pawn and make a queen, you just win the game. Because wherever the knight just was, obviously the rook cannot go there. So what does black do? Push the pawn immediately. And now white is better. We have come back from dead winning for black, dead winning, to losing everything, every piece, and now not pawn takes, but rook takes, and the, the, the pawn also dies. I mean, 
It was a nine, seven, and three point material advantage. The stockfish evaluation at its worst was made in two, it was made in three, it was made in five, it was made in seven, it was made in eight, it was made in nine. And now white is better. And here white plays an unbelievably good move. White fights all the way back and doesn't even want to lose his own pawn. So he guards his pawn first and now is up a pawn in a rook end game. That is madness. Now, this is probably a draw because rook end games are very tricky and when pawns are kind of close together and on the same side, it tends to be a draw. You really should walk the king up with the pawn. So let's let's see this advanced end game technique, right? This is another phase of the game you sometimes have to enter in chess, which is like, oh, now I just have to find the best moves. Like evaluations aside, I really just have to play my best. Um, so rook d7, that's an amazing move. Uh, here there's actually a way you can guarantee winning this pawn. Um, you should give a check. This is what I like to call the boomerang technique. And then check, and now you win this pawn. When you just play rook d7, it allows black to stabilize, and now black is going to win some pawns as well. One of the reasons you like to keep your pawns like this is it's much harder to attack them. Black would need to get all the way around. For example, if in this position after something like, uh, yeah, I mean, after something like a5 and the rook came up, this rook would be able to sneak in. But since white did it, white now creates their own weakness. So now there, there, there is a handful of weaknesses in the black position. So right, that's exactly what white does. White tries to pick up a pawn, but black is also going to be picking up a pawn. Uh, but here, for an inexplicable reason, black actually takes instead of being patient. White wants to attack a pawn. This pawn's not going anywhere, so black should go here because this is not going anywhere. But you rush it, and now white is up two pawns in a rook endgame. You just have to now play something dumb like rook b5. Rook b5 would lose the game immediately because after the trade, the black pawn runs and the king is too far. So just don't do that. Um, rook g4 is played in the game. Uh, I, think you, I think the best move here is to get your pawn involved. So white should play h4. White should get a head start on the race uh, and then, you know, try to do something with like a rook moving and then advancing these pawns and winning, winning the race like that. Uh, obviously, it does not happen. Rook g4, rook b2. And now you have a choice between defending your pawns but being very passive, cut off completely, or moving forward. White decides to move forward, but at what cost? I mean, the cost is the fact that now uh, the black rook was able to take on h2. Still up 3-2, to two, no problem. Best move here, uh, be very careful with a move like rook h4. You have to make sure that when this happens, you don't lose this race. You don't. You're very, very fortunate not to lose the race, because I do get a queen and then I actually x-ray you. So in queen endgames, make sure your king and queen are not super far apart on the same diagonal like this. Um, it's very tricky here. So what I would recommend is finding a way forward with your pawns and king. So g4 is a wonderful move. King e4 is great, rook g3. Uh, now we sort of see the problem. Nothing in white's position can really move, uh, which is why, you know, maybe you have to go king d4. The other thing here is you wanted to give your king, like rook c4 here would, would, would have maybe been the best move to try to come here and let the king walk with the pawns. But black actually freezes white and uh, <clears throat> I mean, white is doing his best, right? He's playing e4. Right now, rook a2 would win the a pawn. So uh, that doesn't happen. Instead, we have check. Uh, now we have rook back to e2. Now you've suddenly let the white king toward these pawns. That's not good because now the white king will monitor those pawns forever, and probably it's getting closer to winning for white, but, you know, people like to repeat moves for some reason, so they repeat moves, and um, we all the way back. So the white king is just dancing. I mean, you look at look, look, the white king's like that. Like, they're in back, they're in back, they're in back. Absolutely no logic to the moves. And now, you're winning. What? Why are you winning? Well, you're winning because one guy attacked the rook, and the other guy thought he was smart and counterattacked the rook. So he forgot about this, this, and now the king touches both pawns. That was black's idea. So black plays king e5. All white has to do is give a check and then take the rook. That's it. Just slide the rook up. Literally one square. You, you cannot get any closer in chess. All right. You cannot get any closer. Rook f5 has to be seen here. And then king takes rook. All right. Instead of that. White plays king back to e3. The king keeps dancing. We have rook g1. And white repeats moves again. If you go back over the last 10 moves, the amount of times that the white king mindlessly shuffled back and forth with no plan of action whatsoever. I mean, 
white font back from Maiden 23579 only to just mindlessly, just the brain totally shuts off and they blunder a back rank reverse check and lose a rook. It is insane that, that this happened. Do you understand? This is crazy. White lost that. White could have saved themselves like 10, 15 minutes. They could have resigned when the game was over. Why did they fight back all this way just to now lose all of their remaining pawns and for black to promote a queen? And obviously at this point you could resign. Uh, there are, so there, the, the, the speed at which you can deliver a mate here is two moves. Always. Why? Cut the king on the back rank and make a mate. It takes black. From a position in which mate in two is possible, it takes black 11 moves to... Uh, look, what is black doing? Like, this is... This is an 1100. And finally, you make the walk. Rook a1 is mate. Nope. Quick. Ah, there we go. Okay. 81 moves later of this absolutely brutal affair, black dominated the middle game only to throw away every single piece starting with the rook then the queen on f1 then oh my goodness i mean the knight and the pawn and white was winning but white lost but as i said in the intro i kind of feel like both players lost this game